the mayor each you kind of talk a little bit more about the freedom school work or the educational advocacy um, work that they do and then we'll move to a more dialogue um, session and Virginia come up and lead us through a little bit more active engagement and conversation with our speakers today okay all right so don't be shy jump in if you have questions I'm sure they don't mind today we have with us Trina Clark James Trina Diane Clark James is a native of St. Louis who grew up in the Ville, okay. Ville neighborhood is the regional director for Empower St. Louis. Empower creates pathways to economic prosperity by providing free IT training and paid internships to young adults ages 18 through 25 from underrepresented communities. They will support them in launching fulfilling and family sustaining digital careers. Prior to Empower, she was the founder and CEO of Jamal Learning Center, a high performing, full service community charter public school with three year looping and open in August of 2011. Her earlier roles within urban public education reform include leading the efforts required by Knowledge is Power program, KIPP, for the successful startup of KIPP schools in St. Louis, and completing the broad res residency in urban education program at St. Louis Public Schools. She began her career in San Francisco Bay Area as an engineer at Celotron and Electronics Manufacturing Company, later moving on to Pinnacle Systems and Video Editing Equipment Manufacturer, and she spent the majority of her engineering career at Apple Computers, Inc., in a variety of roles. She earned a BS in Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology, um, MS in Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University, and an MBA at the University of California, Davis. She currently serves as the Assistant Treasurer for the St. Louis Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and the Vice Chair of the Ford through Ferguson Board of Directors that Dean Nichols mentioned yesterday. Ms. Clark James is a proud mother of three, a beautiful, bright children, Kalani, age 22, Leah, age 18, and Roddy, age 11. They are bright and adorable, I can attest to that personally. She credits her drive and accomplishments to the love and support of her grandparents, parents, and siblings, and her faith in God. So please, let's welcome Trina, Diane Clark James. <laughs>
but before I go into my presentation, just wanted to share with you some of the wonderful people that came into my life as part of the charter school that we started. So. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. And um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share a little bit about my experience being from St. Louis and being part of some really positive things that are going on within our community. So as uh, Dr. Edward shared, my name is Trina Clark James, and I wanted to share a little bit about my experience with starting and, and operating a charter public school in the neighborhood that I grew up in here in St. Louis. So just to give you a little con little bit of context, um, as she shared, I am I was raised in a very historic part of North St. Louis, known as the Deal neighborhood. Um, this is a part of town that is um, includes many uh, historical institutions within the African American, within the Black community in particular. It's where Sumner High School, which was the first African American high school west of the Mississippi, resides. It's also where Annie Malone, um, which I'm not sure how many of you might have heard of Annie Malone, but um, many people think of Madam C.J. Walker as the first black millionaire, um, but actually Annie Malone was, and she trained Madam C.J. Walker. So Annie Malone started a, a college called Coral College, um, which is, was right across the street from what is uh, still now Sumner High School. And, and there she, she trained individuals on um, different aspects of cosmetology, um, including creating their own products. And so that's where Madam C.J. Walker was able to train and develop her own empire. But a lot of people don't know that, that story that Annie Malone actually was a, a, a bona fide millionaire before her. Um, she also was a orphan herself, and so she ended up starting a children's home, which is still in existence now, it's over 100. Um, and celebrated over 100 years now, um, and it's still located in the Ville neighborhood in terms of its headquarters, but they do have an actual home now, moved into a different part of St. Louis. Also, because of our, our rich history within the arts, um, and, and many jazz and blues players coming through St. Louis, that was um, also kind of the hub for, for, um, for the, the musical industry here in St. Louis at that time. So a lot of them would come to the different kind of easies or, or, or lounges within the Ville neighborhood. Now, I'm sharing all this about the Ville, but this is not something I knew when I was growing up. What I saw when I was growing up was just um, you know, decaying houses, more and more lots between vacant, and, um, and just kind of deterioration of a lot of aspects of the community. I didn't know that, though. Um, all I knew was this is where I was growing up. I had a very wonderful family, um, an extended family, as, as she shared, with my parents, my siblings, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, everyone. So all I knew was I was having a good life, and that was all kind of disrupted um, when I got to high school. And so I'm going to kind of share a little bit now more about my story and come back to uh, how that led me to be a part of the charter public school story. So growing up, I attended St. Louis Public Schools for elementary school and thought I was going to the historic Sumner High School, which I literally grew up right behind. Um, and so I was devastated when my parents told me they were putting me in this new program called uh, desegregation or voluntary transfer program. So I ended up being bused out of my neighborhood um, for high school to a very affluent um, neighborhood, um, which is one of our most affluent counties here, Clayton. So I don't know if you've had any kind of um, uh, excursions out into the, the county areas, but uh, Clayton is where like, Washington University is and just on the other side of Forest Park. So was bused out to Clayton High School, and um, while looking back, I definitely appreciate what my parents did for me by giving me an opportunity to have access to resources that I didn't even know I didn't have access to. Um, it, it really bothered me that I had to leave my neighborhood and I had to go to someplace that really felt like a foreign land in order to receive the, the quality of education that I did. So I um, you know, did well at Clayton. Um, I was determined to do that anyway because of what my parents had instilled in me and, and, and my faith. But as soon as I graduated, I left 
and headed to Georgia Tech in Atlanta um, and vowed never to return. So uh, I went off and, and was going about you know, my life and, and what really was um, kind of the storybook life, um, earning my degrees in mechanical engineering and, and being able to start a career in the Bay Area in Northern California. But I, I tell people I had my midlife crisis at 30. So as I was nearing my, my really 29th birthday, when I was my 28th year, um, I, you know, had risen in the ranks at, at Apple uh, Computer. This was during the, the, the era of Steve Jobs being there. So like, I really had an amazing life. I had my two kids and, and um, you know, everything was perfect on paper. But something was like nagging at my heart. I felt like I, I wasn't truly fulfilling my purpose. And so um, during this time was about when um, there was a lot of, uh, um, uh, there, was, there was a lot of activity um, and, and a lot of people going through the Purpose Driven Life um, written by uh, Rick Warren. So it was really through that process um, through uh, a church group and literally going through that 40 days process that um, I was able to really kind of tap into what was most meaningful to myself. And I did a lot of self-reflection. During that self-reflection, I was able to look back on my own personal childhood and kind of the experiences that I had and um, you know, thinking about how that had bothered me so much that there was so much disparity. I, I didn't know that word at the time to use, but going through high school, I knew there was something wrong with the fact that my home life was one way the community I was, you know, growing up in was one way, and then I was being bussed out to something that was completely different. But going through this reflective um, process in my late 20s, I was able to put my finger on and say there was educational disparities and economic disparities at play. Also really thought about what I was um, passionate about, and it always been working with youth. So I had been tutoring and mentoring all through college, and then all into my adult life. Even when I had my own children, I still gave as much time to tutoring and mentoring others as I had before. And the third thing that, um, that came through this process was we really looking at an opportunity that was presented in itself. And that was uh, this idea of a charter public school. So being out in Northern California, um, this was about the early 2000s, so this was like 2000, um, 2000, 2001. I was seeing charter public schools pop up and, and it was very organic um, kind of movement where where I was in Northern California. It was a group of teachers within a school deciding I need to do something um, a little more innovative than what I've been you know, kind of confined to do within the rules and regulations of the traditional district. Um, and the district allowing them to now create this new kind of innovative um, space for, for educating children. Or it was a group of parents in a neighborhood saying that we really want to try something different for our children. So seeing that, putting that together with my um, personal passion for serving youth and, and being a part of growth development of youth as well as putting that together with my own childhood experience and what had been nagging me for you know so many years and realizing that I could not continue to complain from afar about what was going on in, in, in my hometown but unless I was willing to roll up my sleeves and be a part of the, the solution I was just as much part of the problem came to um, came to the realization that my purpose was to serve Young, um, young people and families, really the whole community back home here in St. Louis. And so I left engineering um, when I went on to get a, a MBA with a concentration in education management, UC Davis, and then came back home in 2005 with the intent of opening up a charter public school, a full service community charter public school, really focused on my whole community in 2005. So that is how we all how I got to be where I am now. So a little bit about, um, a, a little bit about Jemai itself. So um, I, I, I saw a TED talk about probably 10 years ago that has stuck with me for, um, since that time. It was by Simon Sinek. And he talked about how it's really important, everybody knows their what, or everybody knows like their how, but it's really important to understand your why. That's what's going to like really motivate you and drive you to do something and to stick with something no matter how hard it is. So we came up, when we first came together um, as our founding team for Jama, we focused on developing what is our why. And so I always like to start with that and just share, you know, our why is at the top. 
everyone is born with unique gifts and talents. Like that is fundamentally where, where we're coming from. And because that is true, you know, that whole idea of no child can left behind or all children can learn, it really all comes from a, a belief that everyone is born with a gift and talent. And so it was our mission to support their growth in achieving their unique level of giftedness. The bottom um, part is, is our mission. And so I always like to highlight it in the mission of Jama that it, um, it was like a story of ands. And what I mean by that is we weren't there just to educate, but we were to educate and empower. It was very important that we thought about it from kind of the whole child, and really not even just the child, but the whole family. So the academic part, critical, absolutely. We're really thinking about how, um, how can we support growth across many aspects of life, so not just academics, but also artistically, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And so we always talked about these five aspects of life that we were um, working to all grow and, and um, develop in. So at, at Jamal, we also came up uh, in the beginning, um, what were our core values? And we knew that that was something we all needed to both um, our, our scholars and families, but also our staff, our board, all stakeholders, we all needed to come together around a, set, a common set of values. And so um, the values we came up with were uh, freedom, achievement, integrity, truth, and humility. And so we were able to make that interaction about faith. And so we always would say that you've got to have faith. And so that can you know, have multiple different, um, multiple different meanings for someone. But it really did come down to these, these were our values. And um, to this day, they still are very much part of my personal values. So Jamal was um, a, a charter public school that was started with a vision of educating and empowering uh, scholars from kindergarten through eighth grade. And it really was our vision to be a part of helping to heal and strengthen the community that I have personally come from and I had seen just continued de deterioration even after I graduated and left, that neighborhood is, is, has continued to decline. So the goal was really to, um, to be a part of kind of revitalization of, of the um, neighborhood and, um, and not just be about an academic institution. So with, with um, our school design, we had really three kind of tenets that were core to what we, we knew we needed to be. The first was academic rigor, really having high expectations. So the idea that because you might be in poverty or you might be from a certain race, you might be from a certain socioeconomic um, class, that, that in, in your past academic performance within that community um, meant that maybe you just can't learn. But I, I did not believe that at all. I mean, going back to our why, we believe that all of our scholars were gifted. And we just, it was our job to find, to tap into what that unique level of giftedness was that they could achieve. So we wanted to make sure that we did, we always consider ourselves as a high performing school and we're setting high expectations no matter where you came in. Um, on your own individualized path, you would be able to achieve giftedness. The second, um, the second core component was that we really were working to be a full service community school. So we recognized that particularly because of, of the communities and neighborhoods that our scholars were coming from, that there were a lot of factors going on in their lives that if we only focused on the academics and did not try to help be a part of, of the, the healing that they individually or their families or neighborhoods, um, really needed, um, considering some of the, you know, the different crises that were going on, that it was not going to have at least as long a lasting effects on them and on their growth. So our goal wasn't just about educating our scholars, but we had um, community partners across many different aspects, whether it was around the arts or, or physical and, and, and mental health, as well as um, you know, uh, financial. So we had many different community partners to come in and work with both our scholars in terms of um, on a day-to-day -day basis, they all had um, at least two hours of what would traditionally be known as electives, but we call them community partner hours, where they would be, uh, they would connect with someone from um, 
PNC Bank that came in and did some programming for our, our older scholars, our middle school scholars, or um, Justice Tennis came in and taught all of them, all of our, our scholars how to play tennis. So can, the community really being engaged and being a part of extending the learning and experience for, for our scholars was important. But we also had three social workers, which was um, very unusual, um, even for uh, a school to have maybe one full-time social worker, but we had one for each of the three-year loops that we refer to as villages, because we wanted our social workers to, to kind of grow with our, our scholars and their families and help address what will come up in their lives and what might serve as a barrier for, for their success, um, not just in our school, but in life. And so that, that, that three-year looping um, was also probably the most, um, uh, was the key to what we were looking to do. So, we had our students stay with the same teacher for three years at a time. They started in kindergarten, they would stay with that same teacher through second grade. They started in third grade, they would stay with that same teacher through fifth grade. And then they started in sixth grade, they would stay with that same teacher or set of teachers uh, until eighth grade. And so the idea was that they can really develop a more meaningful and longitudinal relationship with that teacher. That teacher can that teacher can really understand not only that uh, young person as a person, but their unique learning style, and, um, and vice versa, the student can really understand their teacher's unique teaching style. And so in a traditional school, teachers usually take about the first couple of months in order to really learn this new class of students and how they learn and where they are, what they already have mastered, what they might not have mastered even though they're now in this third grade. And then they'll get into a nice group for about three or four months before now you have to focus on that state standardized test. Being a public school, a charter public school, we had the same requirements as traditional districts to, to complete state standardized tests at the end of every year. So now the last couple of months are kind of lost in just focusing on those state standardized tests and making sure you're completing them and getting everything in. And now the last couple of weeks you're focused on now transitioning these, this class of students so, so you can get ready for your next class. With looping, we were able to really gain um, a lot of time because in that first year with the teacher, yes, they, they did still take a couple of months to really get to know the unique learning styles of their students, and then they got into their group, and yes, they did have to kind of divert a little bit in order to take those state standardized tests, but once they finished those, in our first year in 2011, 2012, we had our, our kindergarten, third, and sixth grade teachers starting on the next year's worth of, uh, oh, like the next grade level of work because they already knew their students and they were gonna still have them. They didn't have to say, well, I'm a kindergarten teacher. I can only teach you kindergarten. If you're ready to start learning, spelling at the first grade level, let's go ahead and do that. And so that's what they did. They also saved time then the next year because they're not trying to relearn these students. They would have a handful of new students each year, but that second year they were able to start, you know, start um, the year off running. So the looping idea really was probably the most critical component that I felt was um, instrumental in, in creating the kind of community and the kind of uh, achievement that our, our students had had. So uh, I do need to just share um, in closing. I, I know that uh, Dr. Edward has asked me to speak about this because our, our philosophy isn't so formally considered a freedom school, but um, as you saw, it definitely is one of our values, and, and we were all about just being a part of building strong and healthy communities and be, being a part of revitalizing the community. Um, unfortunately, um, while we started, we opened up in, in 2011 with three, with three grades, so with our kindergarten, third, and sixth grade, we wanted to start with the first year of each of those loops and then kind of grow each year. Our, our second year, we were able to grow and have our first uh, founding students move up a year with their same teacher, in all cases but one of our six classes, and uh, started with a new group of kindergarten, third, and sixth graders. And so we did, over three years' time, grow to have a full K-8 school. Um, unfortunately, we, we dealt with a lot of um, what I um, would definitely say is politics. And um, we were not able to continue past our original five-year charter. And so our school ended up closing last summer in the, um, in the spring of 2016. And so part of why I also just wanted you to see, see my, <laughs> that was my family. Not only were every scholar that you saw on that became part of my family, but my own youngest son was one of those founding kindergartners. Um, that is now 11, no, 
and um, it is in sixth grade in a different uh, school district now, but um, he was one of my founding kindergartners, and he grew so much, as did so many of our other scholars, and when we closed, it, it wasn't just a school closing, it was like kind of killing our community. So, I needed to share that um, with you, um, because we do feel like we were still trying to fight for what we knew was, was um, you know, what we needed, what was good for us, um, and, I had to rely a lot on my faith, and as Ed Waters knows this, in that kind of last year, and, and trying to go to God and ask again, so this is what I thought I was supposed to be doing. I gave up engineering, I gave up a very lucrative career, I came back to a place that, you know, I had struggles with on how I feel about my hometown, um, but I came back to do what I know he told me I needed to do, and I'm still here serving, um, just in a different capacity now. Um, so it's just, just, just part of my story um, and, and part of all of the scholars that we have part of their story. I do still run into a lot of them on a regular basis. Um, literally just two weeks ago, I ran into another one of our moms and she was telling me about how her, her uh, son and daughter are doing. Um, so this is very personal for me and I want to end on a positive note by just showing you one more quick uh, video. Well, this is a video of some of our scholars in that last year um, as we were kind of doing a wrap up culminating event. Since I've known her, been an inspiration to me. Even though she didn't know it was the first time she saw it, it took three years to get her attention.
35 years old. Um, and a lot of the things that I am involved in now is because of Freedom School. I actually was a scholar in Freedom School when Freedom School first came to St. Louis. And um, from being a scholar, I started working in Freedom School as an intern um, out of high school. And then when I went off to college, I knew uh, when I went to college, I wanted to work with Freedom School or do something with Freedom School. And um, it actually brought me back uh, to St. Louis after college. I went to Lincoln University um, and I messed around in politics uh, <laughs> in the capital of Missouri. And uh, didn't really like that as a quote unquote career. Um, I said I wanted to um, have an impact. And you do have an impact in uh, politics, but I also wanted to have an impact on, a direct impact on children. Um, so that's what motivated me to, to get involved with Freedom School a long time ago, and I'm still involved. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna bring up Alice so she can kind of introduce herself as well. Um, and me and Alice actually met when Alice was a volunteer with Freedom School. And at the time, I was a site coordinator. I was a site coordinator at the time, and Alice was uh, one of those faithful volunteers that just kind of showed up and um, eventually became um, um, a member of staff for Freedom School. And we actually hooked up at another organization, the uh, original organization that had Freedom School here. Unfortunately, uh, due to funding and the politics of things, um, had to shut down and Freedom School uh, was gone away from St. Louis um, for a little bit on that scale. Um, and we were up, at one point, we were up to like 13 sites. Um, and, and like I said, all in a, a year, it all folded. And um, I started working somewhere else and I got a phone call um, that they needed some help with uh, another Freedom School at another organization that they had started. Um, and so I went and I helped out and I ended up getting a full-time job there uh, running their um, youth programs in the community center where I'm at right now. So, and that's where me and Alice uh, hooked up and we, we've been together ever since. We have the same last name, but she's not my wife. Um, <laughs> she's gonna make a great wife, but uh, we, we've been working together um, ever since. And so she's now the program coordinator manage the whole facility. So I'll have Alice come up and then we'll get into um, the Freedom School program uh, because the organization that we work for, uh, Freedom School and our youth programs is, is a piece of what it is that we do, um, but Alice Wilson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. So I'm Alice Wilson. I'm not going to too much about me, but I do want to give my brief freedom school story because as you heard Ms. Evelyn say in the video, it's an empowerment model, right? So I was one of those kids in school, um, trades all, all throughout school, right? Throughout um, elementary school, but I was really shy. And I was that person that read, and I read so well. The teacher was like, oh, keep reading, oh, keep reading. And all the kids were like, oh, she's getting reading. So it made me afraid to read in public. I didn't like it. Even though I could do it well, I was afraid of doing it. Well, in volunteering at um, preschool sites, just on my off days, just something to do, help the kids out, I ended up in a situation in a classroom where a student needs to be taken out, and I was the adult. And what that child, that, that classroom children needed was more important than my fear. And I had to get up and read that book in front of those children. And now, I've just graduated from my fifth year of training nationally on this Freedom Schools program because it changed my life. So if it can change my life, that's, that's my story. You heard Terry's story. It changes children's lives all over the place. Um, throughout this little presentation, you're going to see a lot of common threads uh, from uh, what Ms. Trina shared about KIPP. Um, and we did one of our trainings that TED Talks, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, our program and why we do it um, here. So Freedom Schools program, it came out of um, the, a need. It came out of the 1964 Freedom Summer um, in Mississippi where um, children weren't getting the education they needed in schools because of segregation, because of all, all the Jim Crow laws. So folks decided we are going to create our own schools, right? A lot of them took place in the back of churches. Ch uh, college students, recent college graduates came from all over the country 
to be a part of these Freedom Schools programs. And it wasn't like, okay, I'm volunteer, I'm here, what do you need? These folks were trained to do this, and we keep this model in place now. Uh, we take our um, Freedom School Service Leader interns to Haley Farm, Alex Haley's Farm in Tennessee, uh, for at least a week, it, it tends to change, but at least a week of rigorous training where I like to say we sit at the feet of our elders. We get to meet those who were in the movement. I've met freedom thinkers and freedom writers and folks that were in the cities, and I got to understand what happened with them from their perspective, learn that, and then teach it um, to our scholars. We call them scholars as well <laughs> in our program. Um, so these are program standards, right? Uh, they are required to go to that, uh, that training there, right? Um, they go through this intergenerational leadership thing. This is how they tricked me. When uh, they got me into the program, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna help these kids, gonna be awesome. And I learned so much in the process, I was like, oh, yeah, I got me, you got me. Uh, and a lot of these are just the details of, of a freedom school. So I won't bore you with all of the, uh, the daily life of freedom school. Um, yeah. um, but I do wanna hit a lot of the major points. The thing is, I can make a difference. We say this every single day. I can make a difference. And not just me because I'm an adult and I'm old enough to vote and I have an education. You, as the kindergartner in our free schools program, can make a difference. Starting with who? Me. I have to start with self, right? Now, once I learn that I can make a difference in myself, let me touch someone close to me. Who's closest? Family. All right, now we know that we can make a difference as a family. Let's touch the community, right? We continue to radiate. We can make a difference in our country, in our world, with hope, education, and action. Every week, there is a different theme, and those books um, tie into that theme. And these are the main five pillars of free school. High quality education enrichment. Not just education, high quality education. Intergenerational leadership development. Um, that's the thing that I was telling you about when we go to training. Freedom Schools is not just about educating children. It's about educating adults, empowering um, communities. It's not just a summer program, it's definitely a movement. Um, parental and family involvement, okay? Not just, okay, well we're gonna sign you up, we're gonna make sure we pick you up on time. No, we want you to meet with us weekly. We want to know what's going on with you. What do you need from us? Can we give you some uh, credit assistance? Can we uh, give you some food from our food pantry? What can we do to address the whole child, the whole family, the whole community? Civic engagement and social action. So I'm going to let you speak about social action. I'm going to let the, the politicians speak about that. But every year we have the National Day of Social Action, and this year was really special. Yeah. Okay. So so this year, I do want to go ahead before I go to this. No, I want to emphasize high quality, high quality. When you, when you think about the country, it guarantees you everything but a high quality education. When you look in our constitution, if you break rules, you're guaranteed that you're gonna, you're guaranteed to get a, a, a bed in a prison, but you're not guaranteed a quality education. I want you to think about that when you leave and, and, and you're sleeping in your room. This country does not guarantee a high quality education, but Freedom School does. Um, so the, the civic engagement and the social action. So uh, like Alice said, uh, every year the Freedom School, uh, we kind of look at what's going on in our community. And one thing that Freedom School teaches us is to not just complain about it, but actually get dirty uh, and, and do something about it. Make some noise about it, um, call the right people, um, just action. So one of the things that we're dealing with in our community uh, here in St. Louis is uh, child hunger. Uh, one in every three um, children in St. Louis County and St. Louis City go hungry. And so we wanted not, because the adults kind of in the back of their mind, they know this, but to hear a child actually stand up and give a speech, hold a sign, come to your office and say, hey, we need to do something about this. So our kids, um, we, we sat down and one thing we do, we, we plan what we're gonna do first and then we, we, uh, we, uh, we, we show action. And so the children wanted to get to they wanted to go straight to D.C. 
to figure this thing out. But I, I tell them, I say, hey, we have to start on the local level first and see what we can do on the local level. And then we'll go on the state level and see what we can do there. But we do have representatives here that are in the federal uh, house and stuff like that. So the children actually created these plates. And on the plates, it gave the stats of the children that go hungry. Um, they wrote letters. And we actually hand delivered those to uh, our senator, Claire McCaskill, our US senator. Um, we actually delivered it to uh, US Senator Blunt. Um, we sent letters to the governor. And then we also had a rally right across the street from this hotel. We got together with other freedom schools and we had we held a rally and we made noise while people were at work because it's a lot of uh, office buildings and a lot of people were wondering what's going on but it gets the, it got the conversation going and that was uh, an example of social action of what our children did this past summer oh yeah you have your own mic <laughs> so that's the social action um and one of the major things one of the small project components of the curriculum components is the social action project, so they do this every day. But the goal behind that is to teach kids to define your own problems and figure out your solutions instead of, well, we're gonna tell you what the problem is, oh, and here's what you can do to fix it. Oh, and of course, um, nutrition, um, nutrition, health, and mental health, they get two hot meals and a snack every day, but then we also refer them to whatever services that we have available as far as if you need mental health because no one wants to talk about that. It's one of those big hush-hush topics. But we want to talk about it and we want to also get you help about it. Okay. So the educational philosophy, right? All children are capable of achieving to high standards. The reason why children don't achieve high is because we don't set the standards high for them. If we don't believe that they can do it, they're not going to believe uh, that they can do it. And literacy is essential. So one of the, the main things about this literacy program is that we do not teach phonics. <clears throat> How are we talking about reading, but we are not teaching phonics? So the goal is for students to be able to engage in discussion about the books. So someone's either reading to them, they're doing what we call a jigsaw read, where um, different folks are reading in separate groups and then they come together and they discuss the story. But maybe if you can't read, and you get to hear other people telling you what's going on in the story, well now you can transition through Bloom's technology and that higher order thinking, analyzing and synthesizing this information, even though you didn't specifically read that story for yourself, it's much more about comprehension than it is about um, being able to read those words. And I'm gonna give you a really good fact about that um, towards the end of here. Right, I'm sorry, I, I have to slow down a little bit. I'm really excited oh, when I talk about freedom schools. Um, this is everyone's favorite part of freedom school. This is like the big hook, right? This is the beginning of our day. It is called Harambe. I'll hear everybody say Harambe. Harambe. So Harambe, that's why his word that means let's pull together. But this, this is an informal sharing of time, 30 minutes at the beginning of every day um, that really sets the tone for what's gonna happen in free schools that day. So you could have uh, left from home and you got in trouble for something you did last night or mom's having a bad day. Well, you get to lay all of that out. This is where you get to use your inside voice, your outside voice inside at the beginning of the day. And it sounds really fun, but there's so much um, education going on in it. We do a lot of um, spelling and chanting and call and response and sequencing. Um, and of course, we sing our motivational song Something inside so strong. You said it to yourself every day. We have so many positive affirmations uh, within Harambe. Also, uh, we have a read aloud every morning. We invite folks from the community to read. So whether you're the manager at McDonald's or you're the CEO of Commerce Bank, you're coming to our center and you're gonna talk to children about what it is that you do every day. They get to ask you questions. Do you write a lot of paperwork? Do you get to go out and meet with the community? What is it that you do? Because no matter what it is that you want to be in life, you need to be able to read. You want to be a rapper, that's fine. Can you read your contract? Do you know if you own your own music? However they go, you get to see the people in your space, you get to touch them and talk to them and see what's going on in their lives so that you can make decisions about your own life. And then we recognize our children. 
So yeah, you might have a nice pair of shoes, that's good, everybody can get that. But what you did do was that you helped a kindergartner read uh, for deer time, which we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, when you didn't have to, you helped someone do something. You cleaned up without asking. You don't always get that type of recognition at school. You don't always get that type of recognition at home. But when you come to freedom schools, we're gonna recognize who you are, what it is that you're doing. Uh, this, this is gonna help to uplift you. And then after all that type, we break down some moments of silence and we kind of calm down and we breathe in positivity and we exhale negativity and we get our minds right and ready to transition into our integrated reading curriculum. Um, and then, of course, we have announcements. So this is the main course. You stop me when you read this. I'm sorry, I just keep rolling. Okay, <laughs> this is the main course of Freedom Schools Program. This is the integrated reading curriculum. So here we have, it's a text-rich environment. We have all these different components of what should be hung up in a classroom. But it's not just, you know, just black and white posters. Like, you create an entire theme. Like, it's not just a bullet board. You create an entire theme of different posters that you use every single day. So it's really no good to have a text-rich classroom if you're not referring to the text that's in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the first thing you're going to see is your welcome sign. You're going to see your name on there. You're going to feel all special because you're part of this classroom. Um, our cooperation contract. Every classroom has rules, but in free schools, we have a cooperation contract. We set expectations, but we ask the scholars, what is it that you think we can do in order to keep our class in order? Oh, well, we should respect each other. We should use the one mic rule where only one person talks at a time. And of course, you have to make official by giving your signature on it, even including your uh, several leader intern would, would sign it so that we all agree on something we all refer back to. Uh, we have our weekly things that we talked about posted. And when you read those books um, in the weekly themes, and you'll get to display the work that the kids did under that weekly theme. So that's a good one for funders when they're touring. They can get a quick snapshot of what's going on. Oh, you see the book that they read. You see that Sally drew this really nice image of her family cleaning up the park, or you know whatever you might have going on in there. Um, and that's it's something that's also empowering. The kids get to see that their work got displayed, and people come in to actually view. Um, what it is that they did. This is something they did. It's so exciting for them. Um, we have our daily schedule, agenda, the reading circle. Um, within the free school program, we really value circles. Um, right now, this is kind of similar to what a regular classroom would be set up. I'm the person that's in authority. You see me, I'm standing in front of you. But when we're in a circle, we are all on one level. Everyone can see each other. You ever been in a meeting with a whole lot of folks and you like looking around trying to see who's talking? Everyone can see other. We want to be able to dialogue between, it's not just me talking to you, it's us having a discussion together. Um, lyrics to the motivation, the song, the work, the books, we have books over here on display, feel free to thumb through those um, afterwards, um, and um, any graphic organizer you might need. So, boom, that's um, next. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so make us feel like it's we need to break it up or not. Okay. So the integrated reading curriculum, okay? So we start off with um, an opening activity. That's your hook. We're going to draw you in, right? All right. We have a quick discussion. We got y'all interested in that. All right. Now let's go through the book. We're going to stop and ask questions throughout the book. We're going to make sure that you understand what's going on. We're going to get your perspectives. We're going to get you to make those connections within the book, right? We get that, we go into our cooperative group activities because we want to teach our kids early the benefits of working in groups and having roles within those groups well. This person is gonna be our scribe. We're gonna make sure that everyone has a job. This person is gonna run and get our supplies. This person is going to speak for us when we're ready to present our work. We always present our work because we wanna get those public speaking skills going real early, right? So we have our uh, following that we'll have a conflict resolution activity. What did the character have a problem with? How did they solve it? Did they solve it well? Can you solve it better? Can you figure out a way that we can change the outcome for that? Um, and then we have, again, our social action. We have smaller social action um, issues. Was there a social issue that happened in the book? Do we have that same social um, issue in our community? What can we do to try to fix that type of thing? And the books. I love freedom school books. I love reading school books. We like to call our books Mirror and Window. You're either going to look at this book 
and you're going to see yourself represented in it and you're going to be able to relate to it or you're going to look at this book and you're going to see a window into a culture you never have seen before. So I have a couple of those um, over here on display. Um, things like Grandpa's Everything Black Band. Well, when you get hit in the eye, it's a black eye. Uh, you know, there's black cats you don't want them to cross your path. So they have a really, a real discussion. So that might relate to you. You're going to see yourself in that. Or you might not have ever had that issue. Well, let's see what happened with him in this story. Or Malala. That's an amazing story of a girl in Pakistan who did great things. And she was like 12. Okay, well, you're 12. What can you do? Right? You can impact the world. I'm going to talk about all of those. But those, those are really cool. Um, do we talk about levels? So I want to talk about levels specifically because it relates a lot to the looping that you were talking about. So um, we don't have a classroom of kindergartners, first graders, second graders, but kindergartners, first graders, and second graders are all in one level because if you continue to go through the program, you're going to continue to grow together. You may not necessarily have the same teacher, but you will have um, a similar thing there, and then you're able to um, work with each other so the second graders can help the, the younger ones and, and vice versa because learn from, from each of them. So level one is K through second, level two is third through fifth, level three is uh, middle school, level four is high school, and I like to say level five is being a server leader intern because you learn so much um, through being in that program. I'm sorry, it's, it's really text bits, but um, if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, we'll hopefully have time. I want to jump in too, yeah. Alice. Also, um, I don't know if you guys noticed in the video, but um, the diversity of where the program was is very huge. So uh, what, four years ago they piloted the, mm -hmm. so four years ago uh, Freedom School piloted uh, a Freedom School in a juvenile facility and the response was amazing. Um, and it's real big in California right now in Los Angeles. And so they're kind of like in Ohio as well. So they're kind of like the test models, um, but it's going very well. So this isn't just for you know kids in school and things like that. It's 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 uh, very diverse and um, it's African American children. Uh, we even have an Asian um, Freedom School. Um, it's 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 just it's so diverse. So um, this isn't just you know the the curriculum isn't like one size fits all, it's, it's, it's very diverse. So I just wanted to point that out for you all. So another note on those curriculums, we have a, a pre-K curriculum, well, freedom school test, we, we don't offer that here in our specific freedom school. They have a pre-K curriculum, they have juvenile justice curriculum, they have one specifically for Native Americans, which is really big in Minnesota, um, and then they have uh, a couple other ones. One is um, a Hispanic curriculum. So any curriculum, like the main curriculum, really could go for anyone because the books are so diverse. But in order to reach into a culture-specific story, um, they started to develop those curriculums for um, specific places. Oh, okay. So you know. <laughs> so after activities is really this is where you get to put your own spin on free school, whatever it is that you want to offer in your site. So that could be anything from ballet to basket weaving. But I want to talk specifically about what we do in our site. So, which one you want? I know you want to. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so, we're actually giving you a, a full day of Freedom School as we're going through these different components. So, it kind of makes uh, sense. Everybody following? Okay, cool, cool. So, um, our F, we call it afternoon rotation. And um, in, let, me, let me go back. So Harambe is when we, well breakfast is when we first get there. So the children are fed breakfast. Harambe happens from 9 to 9.30, so it's 30 minutes. And we're very intentional about everything that we do at Freedom School. So we, we stick to our times. Um, and then we have a short break and then we go straight into the integrated reading curriculum and it lasts for? Well, two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. So, so all the stuff that she was explaining um, up until this point um, is a two and a half hour uh, window. And then we go into Deer Time. We go into Deer Time, which is a drop everything and read. It's an acronym. Some of you probably heard of that. But the kids. So this is a reading program, a literacy program. But this gives the children an opportunity 
to pick up whatever they want to read. So they can bring a magazine, it could be a newspaper, it could be a favorite book, but everybody on the site is reading at that time for 15 minutes. When I say everybody, I'm talking about the janitor, the staff, the kids, everybody. So we drop everything that we're doing for 15 minutes as a group and we all read. Um, and then after that we go into lunch and all the kids are fed uh, lunch. And after lunch, we kind of do like a recess break, kind of let them run it off a little bit. And then that's when we go into our afternoon rotation. And our afternoon rotation is, is meant to expose uh, children to things that they probably wouldn't necessarily experience on a daily basis at home or at, in a regular school setting. And I think we failed to mention that this is a summer program. So all of this happens in six weeks. It's a six week program. and. Um, it's a program that can really be ongoing, um, but uh, like my friend over here um, talked about, you know, the politics and everything you go through with starting a school that's non-traditional, uh, that isn't in line with the powers that be, um, you know, you tend to not get support for it. But um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean it, it's not right for our kids. Um, but I just wanted to point that out, that this is a six week uh, summer program. And so our afternoon rotation, you know, locally, uh, we have a lot of things that we do. Um, one particular program, um, we have our healthy internship program. So we were able to uh, get a grant to be able to pay high school students to learn healthy eating activities, um, healthy uh, physical activities, and they actually teach that to the younger kids, um, and they also have a garden that they build. They, they uh, transformed the front of our building into a butterfly garden, so now we have a butterfly garden. Uh, we have an herb garden in the back. Uh, this summer we're gonna be planting fruit trees, so um, that happens in the afternoon. We have chess club, we have a program called Cool Kids. Um, the yeah, after created. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't like the folks, but uh, <laughs> it's for the kids. But Cool Kids stands for College Offers Opportunities in Life. That's what the acronym stands for. And so this component, we actually expose the kids to different colleges. St. Louis have a lot of colleges locally, but we try to get the kids not only to see what's here locally, but to actually get outside of St. Louis. So um, we, we go um, to different colleges and they get an opportunity to actually visit a college, see what the process is and all that stuff. Of, um, getting into college and scholarships, but these kids are like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So it's like in their mind before they even get to high school. Like everything, like I said, everything we do is is intentional and it's to ingrain that in them. And, and I grasp that from freedom school. Right? It's a it's a personal testimony. Wait, before you move on. So one big success that we've had with um, our full kids, we have two of our students who um, have matriculated through our program into our healthy internship program who went on a college tour to Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, completely changed their first choice school and now they're both enrolled in there right now like because they got to see the school uh, from being a part of the school. So that's a huge success for us. Also, we do a program called Mini Society. So Mini Society is basically a program to teach kids to be entrepreneurs, but it's, it's to teach them to, to grasp the entrepreneurial spirit uh, organically. Like, we teach them all the concepts of uh, scarcity and bartering and uh, supply and demand and all those different things, and, and from that, they create their own society. So they come up with their own form of government, um, they come up with the type of jobs, they come up with how they're gonna get paid, they create their own currency, um, so it's everything that they create. And then uh, once we raise the flag, they create their own flag, they create the name of it. And so once the flag is raised, you know, our rules are out the window and whatever rules they have created, that's what they have. They have town hall meetings, um, people create businesses, um, and you know, it's, it's just amazing. Like it's, like I, I wish you could just see it right now, but it's, it's, it's just amazing. So that's uh, our main society component. Oh, President's Council, sorry. So President's Council, um, our students get an opportunity to run for leadership positions in their individual classrooms. And um, 
the kids actually have to register to vote. They go through the whole process. They register to vote. They have a uh, they vote. The people that are running campaign, they put hang up signs. They do all of that stuff. So that's some of the things that we do in our afternoon rotation. Oh, okay. So the evaluation, which um, I think the data in this one is really old. However, um, we received our evaluation from last year, and this is just a huge, it's huge. So we um, assess the reading levels of the students that are in our program. Okay. We had 37% of our students in our specific St. Louis Free Schools program gained eight months of instructional reading. The school year is only 10 months long. So just, and all of that without teaching phonics. Um, and 100% of our students did not experience summer learning loss. So uh, again, something that's really good from looping, like how the teacher already knows who they are and they know where to start off. We didn't have to spend the, our teachers didn't have to spend the next few months reteaching what they should already know to get them on level because they didn't have that summer learning loss. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, um, basically, we need to believe that children can. This was a program that was birthed out of uh, the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights Movement, but this is a program for all children. No one is ever excluded for any reason with free school. Um, socioeconomic background, race, religion, gender, none of that. This program is for all children and the goal is to empower. And it's free. Oh yes, free school means free. So literally, where can you find um, an all day summer program that is free? It's here, come to be honest. It's not free for us <laughs> to run, but it's, not, but it's, but it's free for all of our families. Oh, and that's, that's, and that's it. So thank you all. Like we can talk about freedom to them all day, but thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. I wish I had a couple of the um, servant leader interns from um, the Garrett Evanston Freedom Schools program here so that we could do Harambe. That's what I wanted to do. Um, this is um, a subject that's very dear to my heart in that um, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary is it's either the first or one of the first um, theological schools that has sponsored a Freedom Schools program. And this summer we'll be doing the third summer of that. Um, and we want to talk, um, Sabrina and I both have some questions that we'd like to present about um, liberative pedagogy or other things, but we want to open it up to you first so that you can ask questions of our um, presenters. So. I was just curious about the, the, the mention of politics shutting down a very effective school and I believe affecting another type of program. Um, a little bit more specifics about that if you could. So uh, I'll, I'll start and um, Terry said it pretty much right on the head. If, if you're not kind of in the, um, the traditional, uh, the powers that be have to find what they want to see and even though for charter public schools in particular, the, the whole idea was to kind of have some more autonomy to do something that was different and, and, and innovative. Um, but the powers that be within our local and our state um, has set forth criteria for what they want to see and um, funding for charter public schools comes from the local and, and state entities, even the federal money flows through them. And so there, there was clearly a lot of politics at play um, from actually our first year. Um, so I'll just give a little more context to, to, to make this make a little more 
um, to be able to work with everything. So in our first year, we started with kindergarten, third, and sixth graders. Like I said, we were starting with the first um, year of our three-year loops. And from some uh, norm, um, norm reference testing that's done across the entire country, it's a program called NWEA, or Northwest Evaluation Assessment. Um, we knew from the very first month of our first year that our third and sixth graders in particular had come to us with um, like two year gaps in their learning. So of our sixth graders, um, all but two of them were reading or performing math at a second or third grade level, all but two. And of our third graders, um, we had I think two or three that were on grade level and the rest were like kindergarten, first grade level. So going into the state standardized test that first year, we knew the third through eighth graders are tested here in the state of Missouri. We knew that our third and sixth graders had come to us definitely not on grade level. Um, but our goal wasn't to necessarily get them on grade level, especially with two to three years of, of learning that they had to over, they had to achieve. But within a three years time with our looping model, the goal was to have them go at their different paces to, to get to where they would be on grade level by the end of our three year loop. So unfortunately our first year, um, our state center assessed came back and we were nowhere where we wanted to be. We only had 15% um, of our third and sixth graders uh, performing, um, performing on grade level essentially for the, the math and 11% performing on grade level for reading. So we were told actually the first day of our second year because of those scores that they wanted to close us down. Now, um, the, well they put us on probation, let me say that. They told us they wanted to close us down so they were putting us on probation. So we went into our second year knowing on the first day of the second year that you know we had to make some, some huge strides. We understood that um, because we didn't like what we had for our first year, but we also knew what we were starting with and thought we had five years to grow in STEM. So we worked really hard our, our second year. We did a lot of learning from that first year. Fast forward to May of our second year, have not finished even the state center assessing for the year, haven't um, finished the school year, and we were sent a, a letter from our sponsor that we were um, given 45 days notice of them revoking our charter and they were gonna close us down. So we didn't agree with that and we were told we had two weeks to, to appeal. So we did uh, say we wanted to appeal. Within that two weeks, we actually did it immediately, but unfortunately we couldn't get a hearing, we had to have an appeal hearing um, with this institution, it's a university here in the state of Missouri with, um, with their, a panel of their leadership. That didn't get scheduled until the second week, I'm sorry, the first week of June. By that time, the second year of our school had, had ended. We had to notify families and, and, and staff that we were um, potentially not going to continue on. Um, and so it just really ended our second year horribly. We go into that appeals hearing um, for eight hours. We come out of it and we actually got a reprieve because their own leadership team after seeing the data we showed that showed that our NWA testing, which is done three times a year, fall, the winter, and the spring, showed that our students um, on average had achieved 1.1 years of growth in, in um, reading and 1.5 years worth of growth in math in that first year, the, the days they were looking at. Um, we were just starting to pull together our data for that second year at that time. We also showed that our first year's data on the state standardized test was exactly the same as every other charter public school that had opened up in the city of St. Louis and actually looked better than the majority of the neighborhood schools within the St. Louis public schools. Wow. What it did not look better than was like the magnet schools or the gifted schools, clearly didn't look better than that. But um, we were able to show that we were pretty much being unfairly evaluated or assessed. And that's what their own leadership team determined um, was the, was the case, and so they reversed their action. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done. When we, when now me, as the sole person, um, still trying to carry this on with our board, contact all our staff, they all had had to sign contracts by this point, by the middle of June when we were told that they reversed it. So I had to start with a completely new staff going into year three. What we didn't have to start with was completely new student body, because our families 
they they were so um, happy to see that we were continuing on because they were really excited about just the environment even that they, they, they saw their children in and they felt welcome in. On top of that, we got our scores back in late July for my second year. We had more than doubled in our proficiency in advance from um, the first year. And we knew that that was attributed to the fact that our third grade teachers from that first year really now seeing how their, their students did on the state standardized test, comparing that to how they saw them grow in the NWA, comparing that to how they saw they grown best, they were able to put that directly into um, how they taught in fourth grade that following year with those same students, and they were able to share that with the new third grade teachers being brought in with those new third grade students. And the same thing for the sixth grade um, uh, who carried, continued on with their seventh grade students, um, and they had the same sixth grade, so we had the same set of middle school teachers. Um, so we went from 11% proficiency um, in, in reading to 26% proficiency in reading just in that one year, and we went from 16% to 32%. Still not where we wanted to be, but that kind of growth we knew was coming directly from our model. Unfortunately, we're going to year three now, and my own child who had the same teacher from kindergarten to first grade, now I had to have a new teacher because I had to get all new teachers we had a new teacher for second grade, but like our founding third graders now had a new teacher for sixth grade, and our founding sixth graders had a new teacher for, for eighth grade, and that was across the board. So our third year ended up being very, um, it was challenging. It was worse than even our first year, because it was all new teachers, but all the scholars were the same. Pretty much, we had like 85% um, retention from the, the second to the third year, even with all of this. Um, and so beyond me, Ms. Trina, they like, try to test everyone. They try to test the new principal, the new teachers. Um, but even with that, we were able to get back on track so that um, we had moving from the third to the fourth year um, from during our, our classes and then um, from the fourth to the fifth year. But unfortunately, our, our charter school sponsor had pretty much already said, if they try to close us in the second year, we already knew they weren't going to renew us. They basically just gave us the five years <laughs> that they originally had signed up for. And a lot of it came from um, what I heard informal politics of, of people that um, powers that be not liking that this really was the grassroots. This was myself and some other people from the community who started this. We didn't come from a big network. Uh, we didn't come from a you know kind of um, endorsed group of leaders. So um, I took all that learning I had from working to, with the Kit Foundation to bring them here and thought I can apply this. This is truly a homegrown initiative. But um, as I was actually told by someone offline, I didn't kiss the ring. And because I didn't do that, um, we did not have the kind of buy-in at the, the, the formal you know, political level to Questions? Oh, this may be both a comment and a question. First of all, my heart goes out to you because we fought very similar battles in the state of Minnesota, even in the public school system. And I want to say something to all of us in this room about how in the United States context, yes, we are all religious educators, and the public schools don't leave much room for religious education. But I think if we actually care about justice, if we care about uh, what you were, <laughs> I couldn't help thinking about your statement early on, we don't guarantee a high quality curriculum. This is where I think religious educators need to be working, right? And I, I'm remembering what Willie Jennings said a couple of years ago about where theologians really need to be thinking about public education. And I'm a Roman Catholic saying this, okay? I'm somebody who is in the middle of, you know, we have a whole parochial system in the United States. We have got to start putting our energy behind this. And one of the things I want to, I want to ask you about, we in Minnesota have one of the worst achievement gaps between black and white kids and native and white kids of any state in the country. And years of working on it, finally people, advocates have started to say, you know, it's not an achievement gap, it's an empowerment gap. And I think that there's been too much energy placed around scores and test scores and a huge amount of work. I mean, great that you have data that shows that stuff. But it's not measuring civic literacy. It's not measuring any of the other wonderful things that the Freedom School is doing or you are trying to do. So please, religious educators, can we 
start focusing on public education? I have to um, have Sabrina hand me my notebook because I wrote while y'all were talking, what can religious educators do to help promote justice in education? Um, and I think that's a question we need to continue to ask. I do have a small question since I don't think it happened in your presentation. Maybe you can explain what Jamon means and also the village model that is based on more African philosophy that led to this looping and all of that um, and how that associate, aligned a lot with the identity of your scholars. Yeah, so uh, Jama actually is, he's why he leave for, um, I say family, village, and tribe, but where um, the real story behind it was when I was going through that kind of soul searching and determined that I was going to give up engineering, come back to St. Louis and be a part of some positive change. Um, at the time, I, I was the manager for all of the America's tech engineers within Apple, and it was a very international group. And so one of one of the engineers was actually from Africa and I asked him because I knew I wanted it to have, I knew I wanted the school to have, um, be very Afrocentric, knowing that the majority, if not all, and it did end up being 100% of our students were African Americans, were black. Um, I asked him, what is the word in your language, which he ended up saying was Swahili, um, what is the word in your language for family, what is it for tribe, and what is it for village? Um, so it was the, all the things that we want to achieve. This be more than just a school, but truly be like the village mentality of we are all coming together to help us all rise. And he told me, I can't answer your question. And I, I, I don't understand what you mean, you can't answer my question. And he said that, um, well, those three things are all interchangeable. And it's like, there is no distinction between your family and your village and your tribe. So he said, what he could tell me was there were three words that maybe loosely um, if you try to distinguish them, um, and, and so one was Jama, one was Ingu, um, Ingi, and, and one was Kabila. And um, I just picked Jama, um, one because it just was a little easier to say and spell, <laughs> then two because that whole idea that we don't make that distinction. We, we are all one family here. And so actually I just wanna actually touch then on, on what you just said. I love that you said that about um, you know, what you can do as religious educators, knowing that technically you have to be separated from the public school system, but um, I'm sure with the power that you have to be able to really advocate for changing just how public education works in this country, that all that we were measured on for by our charter school sponsor was state standardized scores. They didn't want to even look at the growth that we were, that we were able to show every year through the NDRA test. They don't want to look at the fact that we weren't just there to educate children, but as we both all have said up here, it was about empowerment and, and how they were growing as young, you know, as um, strong, vibrant, spirited. And so I wanted to show that last video. So you saw even amidst, um, you know, what was a, a really traumatic year for us in our last year, that, that positive spirit was strong with our young people, that they would write that song, they would talk about, I don't care what anybody tries to do against you, like you are strong, you are Jamal Jaguar, you know, we're going to be all right. That's not something you can measure with just a once a year state standardized test. But unfortunately, that's what our public education is, our system is set up on. And because it's set up on that, and that's where funding then, can, then flow from, and public schools are dependent on public funding, it, it really just kind of creates this um, unfortunate situation where we're not really growing um, good people. We're just, you know, um, trying to produce good test takers. Other questions? So I have two sort of related questions, and you can speak to either or both or neither, uh, depending on what interests you. Um, one that I'm curious about uh, in all of your programs is what uh, experiences you had, what you learned about dealing with um, differences in learning ability or specifically learning disability or physical uh, or mental disability. Um, and more broadly, I think the best way to frame it is uh, in all the education you've done in your programs, what was your most surprising takeaway as far as what's effective for education, what's impactful for children? Um, what would be perhaps both 
most most necessary, or what would you most like to tell us as religious educators? That's a different way of phrasing it. That's a lot of great writing. <laughs> <laughs> you said a lot. Um, I, I'll just start. Um, I'll take a piece of what you said. Um, my biggest takeaway um, was the fact, and it kind of touches on um, what you went through with your school, is the fact that as a society, um, the people that are in charge don't really see the value of what is really working. Um, and they have their own guess philosophy of what works for a certain community and they don't really listen to the people in that community. And that was one thing that really motivated me to just really get involved with politics. I'm, I'm on the city council, but I'm also on the school board. And and I, I did that, one, because I had kids, but two, I saw early on the effect of people in charge and one, one vote can change a whole nation, you know? So um, I wanted to be that vote uh, that was connected to the people that was actually doing the work. So my biggest takeaway from all this work is the fact that people don't um, really value what, what's really working. Like my biggest philosophy when it, when, it, when it comes to going into those meetings and voting is to just do what's right. Do what's right. Um, do what you would do for your own children. Do what you would do for your own family when you're making these decisions that affect a whole community. So that that's that's how I vote, <laughs> and that's how I govern. So, um, one thing I'd like to say about um, different learning abilities um, in the Freedom Schools classroom is the fact that well, we kind of we're at an advantage because we're not teaching in that same sort of way. So we don't have to make everyone read aloud. Um, and in fact, it's an option. No one has ever made, here, put this book in front of you, you have to read this. Um, we don't do popcorn reading or round robin um, unless it's voluntary. And with that, um, you can be that quiet kid that doesn't have to um, worry about mispronouncing the words or stuttering or not knowing and still gain the information and now you're empowered to be a part of that discussion and you're able to, though you might not be able to spell correctly, but when it comes to, um, we're going to draw a poster of advertising the event that took place in, in the book. Well, you can do that, or we're gonna act out um, the skit that um, whatever happened in chapter two, you can do that. So it's much more part and makes you want to pick up the book and read it yourself because you're not put on, um, put the spotlight on you um, for everyone to, to have the opportunity to ostracize you because you don't know or you're unable. So we have that unique um, ability to do that in our classroom. So it, it's interesting you asked about the, um, you know, what essentially is like special education services within a, a, a public school system. Um, that was also another thing that from a political standpoint was very frustrating and very, um, challenging to work with. And, and it wasn't from a, the standpoint that many might think. We ended up having um, a higher percentage of, of, of our scholars that had an IEP um, than even in the, the school district, in the St. Louis Public School, a school District. And, um, and we ended up then identifying more um, and, and what we actually saw was that there's this kind of negative stigma of, oh, if you have a high percentage of students, it must be that you have all the slow kids. Um, and that was actually something that even our, our sponsor tried to use against us um, initially, too. But what we found was really everyone should have their own individualized education plan. And that was the aha moment for me. We ended up giving more than what our um, our sponsor felt like oh, we should be doing um, because if we saw that this young person, whether they met the criteria to be diagnosed now to then get whatever additional funding, because that was their thing. They were like, well, you're, you're doing something, you're not getting the funding that you need. Um, you know, like, this is very expensive for you to, to do all that you're doing. At the end of the day, I don't care about the funding. I know I needed to, <laughs> but I felt like th these are my 
these are my babies. And just because they don't fit into this box that the government has said they have to meet this certain criteria for to give you some more money that still isn't enough to give them what they deserve. Um, that was just a whole nother aspect of this whole political, the way just the educational system is set up and trying to fit people into boxes and unless you meet these criteria so they can get the funding so that we shouldn't be doing anything extra for you. Um, so I look about how it really did come from the idea of roofing or um, even as they were saying this, the idea of multi-age, whatever it is, when you're, you're not the same, this is my cookie cutter way, if I teach kids and, and you come into my, you know, you come into the oven, you should all come out the same way, and if you don't, there's something wrong with you. But really just saying, I want to meet each of you individually and discover what is your, I use that term a lot, but your unique level of giftedness. And it's my job to help tap into that and help you be able to fully realize that. I just wanted to Touch on, on that too, because uh, we I, were, I was having a conversation about um, you know IEPs and individual education plans, and um, the conversation was when you go to a doctor, uh, you're not going to get um, headache medicine if you have like heart problems or stuff. You know you, you get evaluated, and the doctor says, okay, this is what we need to work on. You got high cholesterol, high blood pressure. We're gonna work on this. The same thing needs to happen when it comes to education. It's no, like you said, there's no cookie cutter way of doing it. Everybody needs to see where they are, how they learn, everybody learns different. And, and taking that approach, uh, we will educate our, our children and empower our children. So I just wanted to share that. Um, I just wanted to add to that. I have to give my little two second sermon of um, my philosophy is, is uh, wrapped up in a quote from Mercy Oye, who is an um, African theologian, um, feminist theologian, who says, and it's true for me, who says, I'm not a mother, but I have children. And I add to that, all children are our children. It's a theological anthropology qu question. And until we as religious educators and persons in the church need to help folks in the pews understand that all children are our children. And so that's what I would like to, um, uh, what's the word, encourage all of us as religious educators is how do we help our communities understand that all children are our children. And we've had a really good um, pres presenters today that have helped us recognize this here in St. Louis. And we want to thank you so much for coming to me. So I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with REA, but our current program chair for um, this year's event um, is, um, from Turkey, and her name is Moala, and her mother um, created special gifts for the board. And um, when we talked about you all taking your time out to come and share with us and share your wisdom and the work you're doing, um, we have three special handmade gifts from her mother in Turkey, and it is symbolic. So hopefully I'll do justice on explaining this um, very quickly, but so it's not only the handmade pouch, um, but as you go out, um, how it explains to us, it's a handmade pouch um, for each of you, and it holds then this uh, keychain with what they call, we probably would say the all seeing eye, but an eye of protection, and so it's made like the eye for watching you and to cover you as you go forward, et cetera. And so that's just a small token from each of us to say thank you. And thank all of you. I know everybody dispersed, and it's been a long day, but I really appreciate all of you being here. Hopefully, we can share the information with others, and I think two of our presenters are gonna start joining us for dinner tonight, so hopefully um, others, or if you have more questions and they wanna have direct communication with them. So, thank you.